Why are you still buying diesel? You have cooking oil, right? Great, you can turn it into your own cheap DIY diesel, specifically biodiesel. Step 1. Grab the materials. All you'll need is a lower hemispherical heating mantle with SDC digital temperature controller or a hot plate with stirring, a borosilicate 2440 1-liter round bottom flask with ground glass joints with a 2440 30cm reflex condenser, more borosilicate stoppers, a 250ml separatory funnel, various Erlenmeyer flasks, beakers, stir bars, spatula, stir rods, cat clips, stands, tubing, ice bath, pump, methyl alcohol, sodium hydroxide drain cleaner, optionally calcium chloride, filter paper, goggles, gloves, a lab coat, and finally your vegetable. Right, and don't forget to put a fume hood in your shopping cart. Step 2. Dry your glassware, uh, alright. Step 3. Get your vegetable oil. So here's my vegetable oil. You'll need about 500 mils per run, so I poured out a little. Looks pretty average, right? Well, you probably have a big can of waste cooking oil sitting at the back of your kitchen for decades, and you can use that as well. You can also get it for free from restaurants, if you didn't know that. Now, since my cooking oil is so fresh, I didn't have to do this, but if you do use waste cooking oil, make sure to use a 25 GPM oil centrifuge to separate. Just kidding. Just let it settle and then filter it through some fine coffee filters to get rid of any of the crumbs. It is also often recommended to dry the cooking oil with a drying agent, like calcium chloride to make sure that minimal water is present, as this might be important in the next step. You can then pour this through another filter. Now you have your vegetable oil cleaned. Finally, for the reaction, you can pour 500 mils of it into a big 1 liter round bottom flask. Let's move on to the next step. Step 4. Methyl oxide. Go get your sodium hydroxide and methanol. Go! Quick, quick! Okay, it's not that intense. The reaction we're doing here, called a transesterification, needs a sodium hydroxide catalyst to form a methyl oxide ion in equilibrium. This will get our transformation going. So first pour in about 140 mils of methyl alcohol for every 500 mils of cooking oil. Be sure to not inhale the methanol vapors or drink it, because apparently 10 mils can make you blind. You can then pour in like 4 grams of sodium hydroxide, as you see here. Then chuck in a magnet thingy and get it mixing. It doesn't fully clear up, but when the big chunks disappear, you're good. So basically, this is the equation of what's happening right now. Essentially, it's a proton transfer. If you're new to chem, think of it as basic math. Methanol plus hydroxide equals methoxide plus water. Although, the equal sign isn't 100%, like, this transformation doesn't happen completely. Not all of the reactants are converted into products. Looking at the acidity of the two tells us that only around 6% of the hydroxide turns into methoxide. Step 5. Water bath. No, you don't go take a hot bath. Our 1 liter round bottom flask does. Specifically, we want the bath to constantly heat our reaction mixture at 60C without a heating mantle because I don't have one. You want to grab a bowl of water and fill it with an adequate amount of water. Then place our 1 liter round bottom flask in that bath. Step 6. Build the setup. This is called a Liebig a Lie big? Lie big condenser, bruh. Put it in. This is a glass stopper. Put it in. This is a funnel. Put it in. This is our 140 mils of sodium hydroxide and methanol mixture. Put it in. This is a thermometer with an adapter. Put it in. These are Keck clamps. Put it in. Just kidding. Put them on. Grammar, guys. Step 7. Get mixing. Now since methanol is polar and oil is non-polar, aka they're immiscible, they're not going to mix ever and the reaction ain't gonna start happening. So you wanna crank up the stirring to the max for maximum surface area between the two substances so that they can actually react at a feasible rate. You can see how it forms an interesting and opaque suspension. Step 8. Get heating. Now the reaction will be extremely slow without adequate heating as well. That's why you want to heat the water bath and closely monitor the temperature, making sure that it's actually at 60C and not higher or lower. And I'm seriously considering getting a temperature monitoring heating mantle, because I think I spent hours trying to make it stay at 60C and constantly monitoring this thing. Step 9. Wait for 3 hours. Nice, if you're new to this and wondering what this monstrosity of a setup is, it's called a reflux, bro where our reaction mixture is continually heated at a required temperature without losing any of our substances. This is because as they evaporate, they condense back down due to the cold water running in the condenser. This waiting part was the most annoying because I had to stay around it and babysit it for like 3 hours making sure its temp was at 60C, while being so sleep deprived. I began to understand why mad scientists are mad. Anyways, what we're doing here, although it looks like not much is happening, is a transesterification reaction. 
This is vegetable oil. It stores fat in the form of a triglyceride, which is a glycerol backbone bonded three times via an ester bond to three fatty acid chains. What we want to do is kick off that glycerol and replace it with three methyl groups that come from our methoxide ion, forming our biodiesel. Thus, biodiesel is also known as fatty acid methyl esters. So this is what the full reaction equation looks like. The R represents the fatty acid chain. Simple, right? Ba okay, if you really want to know what happens, basically this methoxide ion is a really strong nucleophile, so it'll do a nucleophilic attack on this electrophilic central carbon in our triglyceride and try to attach on. Now since carbon can't have 5 bonds, these two electrons will be kicked onto the oxygen, giving it a formal negative charge, and then it will come back down again, but this time it removes the glycerol. Now imagine this happening three times because it's a triglyceride, and all three bonds to the glycerol break, releasing the triol with three negative formal charges on the oxygens. Now since water was present in the methoxide equation, it'll come back and protonate it three times, forming neutral glycerol and also reforming our hydroxide catalyst. I mean, isn't that just cool? Meanwhile, the nonchalant sodium ion is just watching all this chaos. He's like, nah, I'm just stay out of this. So you might think nothing happened in this one liter round bottom flask, but in reality, a snow globe of chemistry was going on inside. Step 10. Take it apart now, bruh. After like 2.5 to 3 hours, you can finally stop the reaction. When the stirring was stopped, this is what it looked like. Pretty neat, eh? I mean, immediately you can see it separating into two layers, and this is exactly what we wanted. The brown bottom layer is our dirty glycerol, which is denser than the oil, and the yellow layer on top is our biodiesel, aka fame. Step 11. Repeat this entire thing. You know me now. I like not only to make stuff, but I want to mass produce it. So I transferred the mixture into a big Erlenmeyer flask and did another entire run. Exactly the same because I wanted more of this bio juice. Step 12. Separate them. When both runs finished, I had sat in front of my fume hood for like 5 hours now staring into the beautiful yellow chemistry taking place. Then I can transfer everything from the two runs into my separatory funnel and pour it through multiple times to separate all the biodiesel from the glycerol. Anyways, as you can see here, oh shoot, a rookie mistake, but my separatory funnel was open low. Anyways, as I was saying, they slowly separate until shoot, my lab spontaneously caught on fire. Anyways, as I was saying, you need to give it a good amount of time for it to form two clear distinct layers, then drain it. By the way, my funnel is only 250 mils and my mixture is like 1.2 liters, so this took a few passes. Also, if you guys know anything about anything, you'd know that glycerol is clear and not this brown messy goop. And you're absolutely correct. This is because it's full of impurities and I'll be finding a way to purify it and turn it into some cool stuff in a future video, so stay tuned. Now after separating the two, you can see the beaker full of dirty glycerol on my clean biodiesel. I had a good amount of it, but it's still really dirty, so let's get to cleaning it up. Step 13. Clean it. So basically what you want to do is get rid of any unreacted or random impurities still within that diesel. I mean it looks clean, but not really. After letting it sit for a bit, you can see some weird layer at the bottom as well. See if I pour some of it into a separatory funnel and do a water wash, you can see how it forms this weird emulsion and the water gets murky and pulls away some small amounts of my diesel if I don't wait long enough before draining. This is due to small amounts of surfactants still left, like monoglycerides. Anyways, I think this step took me 2 hours to do due to the massive amount of biodiesel I had to mass clean and I didn't have the patience to wait for very long so I'm sure I lost some of my biodiesel in the process when draining out some of the emulsion, but it doesn't really matter anyways. One solution to this, actually, is to mix our biodiesel with another solvent, like toluene, as you can see in Chemiolis' video, and this helps stop the emulsion from forming. Anyways, I didn't have that. After washing the entire 1 liter with water like 3 times, I had finally finished and you can see the wastewater. 
After filtering it for no reason, there's just a few more steps. I know, we're not done yet. I agree this is taking forever, but you also want to wash it with a saturated sodium chloride solution, as you can see me making here, to really make sure you pull out all of those impurities. An acid wash was also recommended, but at that point, I'd already lost an entire Saturday doing this, so I think it's good enough. Now after filtering it for one last time, I add my pure biodiesel, yay. Wait, it's still cloudy. Shoot, we're still not done yet? Step 14, dry it. That's right, I still need to dry it. It's still wet. So I put in some anhydrous sodium sulfate, shake it around and wait for a night. When I came back, I filtered it and it still felt a little cloudy. I have no idea why, so I dried it with some anhydrous calcium chloride as well. Looking back, I think it's due to the cold. Biodiesel generally starts getting cloudy at temps below 10 C, and you know Canadian winters, or spring more or less now. Finally, after gravity filtering the diesel just to make sure it was really 100% pure, this is my final product. It looks pretty nice. It's also a little less viscous than vegetable oil, and it has a pretty nice, bright yellow color to it. Step 15. Test it. Now I can finally put it in my car because it needs a little refueling. Wait, 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 don't actually try this. I mean, maybe you can, if your car is a truck that runs on diesel, or if you're extremely confident about your chemistry skills that you're sure your biodiesel is really, really pure. I personally wouldn't risk my 2022 Lexus ES 350 Sport for this, haha. I mean, I have seen some guys online do it, but that's only because they're like car geeks. I mean, this thing could absolutely destroy your engine, so make sure you do your research before even attempting to use this thing. I have to say though, another less risky method to test it out is to put equal amounts of it on some paper. And on the left we have vegetable oil, on the right we have our biodiesel. You can see how the biodiesel does burn pretty well, but it does have some difficulty getting lit because of its high flash point. Biodiesel also burns with less soot than regular diesel, and there's also a net zero carbon footprint because the CO2 that gets released by it gets reabsorbed by the plants to make the diesel, and the cycle continues. However, biodiesel might not be the perfect future fuel because of conflicts in land usage. Like should we grow crops for food or fuel? Step 16. Subscribe. Step 17. Support Carbon on Patreon. Thank you so much dedicated viewer for making it to the end for real. Again, I really want to thank my Patreon supporters for making these projects affordable and I will provide behind the scenes, early access, shoutouts, and more. If you would like to support a high school student like me, just $3 will go a long way in helping this channel to continue providing quality and educational chem content. Anyways, thank you so much for watching till the end, and please consider clicking the subscribe button below.